You are in Mandalay EF right now, getting ready to listen to Matthew Graber speak about abusing Windows management instrumentation to build a persistent asynchronous and fileless backdoor. Uh, as usual, please make sure that your phones are silenced. Uh, we don't want to hear your ringtones. Uh, this is Matthew's show. So, Matthew. Thank you. All right. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so I'm sure many of you are already familiar with WMI, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here. Uh, WMI is really an amazing technology, super old school, been around forever. It's really powerful for administrators, and consequently, it's really powerful for attackers and also defenders, and I'll touch on, on the, the defensive side briefly at the end. All right, but we're here to talk primarily about offense. All right, so some things you may not be aware of Attackers are abusing WMI in the wild. Attacks go back as far as 2010, at least as far as I'm aware of. Uh, those are the, going back to 2010 is like the first publicly documented case of uh, malicious WMI in use, okay? Uh, some of you may not be that familiar with WMI. In that case, I'll be going over some of the basics, all right? And you may not know how to prevent and detect such attacks. Um, later on, I'll get into some Pretty cool techniques how you can use WMI against WMI attacks itself, as well as some additional mitigations, all right? Now, um, you may only be aware of its malicious capabilities as described in public reports. So I highlight this because, um, you know, you, you only know what, what you know. So um, I, I plan on describing some theoretical attack vectors, um, as well as uh, some additional uh, WMI attacks that uh, we at uh, Mandiant and FireEye have seen in the wild that you may not be aware of yet. All right, with that said, I'm a malware reverse engineer at FireEye. I'm on our FireEye Labs advanced reverse engineering team. Um, we've got a really bright group of guys that, that we work with. And uh, we also just re uh, released our second Flareon challenge, so uh, check that out on uh, flareon.com. All right. Uh, I've spoken at various conferences, and uh, as you may or may not be aware, I am a huge PowerShell fanboy, all right? Okay, so sophisticated attackers are living off the land, and I wanna give a shout out to, to my buddy Chris Campbell, who kinda coined that phrase in this context, all right? So basically, any tool that's useful to a sysadmin is gonna be extremely useful to an attacker as well. Right, so um, I, I would like to think that you know that this is probably like a huge security gap for those security vendors out there who are focusing really heavily on you know scripts or binaries being dropped to disk. This is entirely unnecessary, as you'll see. WMI is just one means to execute your malware without dropping anything to disk. Of course, there's PowerShell as well, which enables you to execute really any conceivable payload that you would be able to write in C in user mode uh, entirely in memory using PowerShell. All right. Now, I, I, I like to say this a lot, all right? If you can dream it, all right, from like an offensive researcher's perspective, it's probably already been done, right? So I said that the public reports of WMI attacks go back to 2010. Right? Well, WMI has been around since like the dawn of time, like since uh, Windows 98, right? So who's to say that that is the first instance of WMI attacks, all right? So there's probably people in this audience, people not present here um, who, you know, are already experts on WMI, but uh, they're probably not the ones who are speaking at, at conferences, all right? So a little outline here. I'm gonna cover the basics. Some of the WMI utilities, so how you go about actually interfacing with this technology. Um, one of those ways is using uh, WMI query language, WQL. It's very simple uh, SQL-like syntax for working with this stuff. Um, and then I'll cover WMI eventing and remote WMI. Um, these are like what I consider to be the, the killer features of WMI, all right? Um, I'll briefly go into uh, how WMI has been used by attackers in the past, as well as I'll cover some like theoretical attack vectors that I personally haven't seen used in the wild. Um, I'll also touch upon providers. Providers are uh, DLL 
DLLs or device drivers that really provide WMI all of its functionality uh, under the hood. Um, I'll wrap this up with um, like pure proof of concept of WMI backdoor that I developed. Um, all it is is a PowerShell script. It's just an installer, but it doesn't require that the, um, that the target system have PowerShell installed on it. So you theoretically could install this on a Windows 98 machine. And then I'll uh, cover uh, detection mechanisms and uh, attack mitigations. All right, the basics. So WMI, Window, Windows Management Instrumentation, it's been around forever, like literally since Windows 98 and NT4. All right, so from your Windows 10 machine with PowerShell on it, you could easily run payloads on a Windows 98 or NT4 system. Uh, the technology fundamentally has not changed. Um, system administrators have been aware of this technology forever. Um, I, I think it was like just recently that this has really come to the attention of uh, security researchers and, and uh, pen testers and, and red teams. All right, it could be used to do some really useful things, okay? We can read from the registry, write to the registry, uh, examine the file system, drop files, read files, all right? Uh, you can also execute commands, all right? Uh, this, this is used pretty heavily. Um, WMI is used as a technique to perform uh, lateral movement and code execution, uh, primarily using the uh, Win32 process uh, create method. And you can also subscribe to events. And these events uh, persist across re reboots and uh, don't drop any files to disk other than uh, a single file which AV would never touch. And what is that file? It's objects.data in system32 WBEM repository. All right, this is the WMI repository where all persistent WMI objects, as well as namespace definitions, uh, class definitions, uh, everything is stored in here. All right, this is a completely undocumented format until tomorrow when uh, we're gonna be, so myself and my colleagues, uh, Claudio and, and Willie, um, are gonna be releasing a white paper that's gonna come out on the, the FireEye uh, blog um, that, that covers um, how, how to parse all this out. And also we're gonna be speaking at DEF CON about using WMI for defense and performing forensics on this objects.data file, all right? So uh, William and Claudio did some really amazing work reversing this stuff and uh, they, their uh, forensic parsers are available online right now. So please check those out, all right. The WMI settings, just for your general knowledge, um, these are stored in the Microsoft uh, WBEM registry key. Um, you can also access them via the Win32 underscore WMI setting uh, class instance. All right, so uh, this is one of the things of interest in here is uh, the auto recover MOFs entry. So one previously popular persistence technique was to drop a MOF file um, onto a uh, victim system, run mofcomp.exe, and then that would be consumed, and, uh, and then you, you would have your persistence mechanism. So uh, MOFs are, are kind of cool. Um, they're not necessary in my opinion, but you can drop MOFs if you want to persist your WMI payloads beyond uh, WMI repository corruption. So I don't know why you'd wanna do that necessarily. Uh, it does create additional forensic artifacts, but it's something to be aware of that you as a defender should be looking at. All right, so how do we interact with this stuff? Yay, PowerShell. PowerShell is like the best utility out there for interacting with WMI. Uh, this is a PowerShell version three window that you're looking at. Uh, and what you see here is uh, a grouping of uh, both WMI commandlets and SIM commandlets. There's not really too much of a difference uh, between the two, only the WMI commandlets are like the, the legacy ones. So these are present going all the way back to, to PowerShell 1. Uh, the SIM commandlets uh, were introduced in version 3 and above, and they do, they do the same exact thing as the WMI commandlets, only they talk both protocols, which I'll get into briefly. So the, uh, D, both DCOM and WinRM which uh, is gonna be present on more modern Windows OSs. All right, some additional utilities you should be aware of. 
I'm sure many of you are familiar with Wimic.exe. Okay, this is a really powerful utility. It does have some limitations. Uh, PowerShell, in my opinion, is always gonna be uh, the best way to work with this stuff. Um, there's WinRM. So if the WinRM, or so I, I'm gonna use like the terms WinRM and PowerShell remoting interchangeably. If that service is listening and say like application whitelisting for whatever reason like blocks PowerShell, uh, you could run WinRM to enumerate um, uh, WMI object instances, you could execute WMI methods. Uh, it, it, it's a pretty powerful utility if uh, that's what you have to fall back to. Uh, WBM test is really cool. It's like a really crappy, uh, like GUI interface. It's it, it serves as like a like like a test utility. Um, I've run in like in various assessments in the past. I've run into cases where like I couldn't run Wimic.exe or PowerShell.exe. So th this was a good fallback. Um, you, there's pretty much nothing that you can't do with regards to WMI via this tool. Uh, you just have to get over the crappy interface. Uh, there's a bunch of Linux utilities as well. Uh, WMIC will accept any like um, any WMI query. Uh, w, WMIS is basically like a wrapper for the Win32 uh, process create method, you know, for like lateral movement and code execution. And then a good buddy of mine, uh, Skip Duckwall, uh, patched WMIS so that it will accept uh, NTLM hashes, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's some additional interfaces as well, VBScript, JScript. Um, if you're gonna uh, incorporate this into your code, you have some COM APIs, as well as some pretty full featured uh, .NET classes. All right, so if we're gonna interact with this stuff over the network, uh, which is pretty amazing that we can do this because on every system, this, uh, uh, the WMI service is already listening. All right, so uh, the protocol that's been around forever that is still likely listening on every single one of your systems is DCOM, all right, TCP port 135. Um, so port 135 is used to establish an initial connection and then uh, all subsequent data is passed uh, via a secondary uh, TCP port number specified in uh, the, the range that you see here in this uh, registry key. Uh, you can actually use DCOM config or just modify the registry entry directly to have it only use a, a single port so that you can maybe make it like a little more firewall friendly. All right. So here's an example of me using, um, I'm, I'm calling get WMI object and I want to enumerate uh, processes on this remote system. So it's really simple. You just uh, provide the, the host name or IP address, the credential, um, so you, like you provide like the domain or the host name and, and the username, it'll prompt you for credentials and then you get a, a nice process listing. All right, uh, the other protocol, the, this like modern protocol uh, for like uh, it's called PowerShell Remoting or WinRM. Uh, it is a SOAP based protocol. It's encrypted by default. Um, so like if you were to install like server 2012 R2, I believe, like in server core mode, uh, this would be the only port listening. So uh, you would have port uh, 5985 listening. Uh, th there's a really handy PowerShell commandlet. Uh, it's called test-wsman. It's like a really convenient port scanner uh, that doesn't require authentication. Uh, so like you could sweep the enterprise to see what machines are listening on on this handy protocol uh, Also, you can configure all of the settings uh, uh, Within PowerShell using the WS man uh, PS drive so another reason PowerShell is really cool is because of the concept of PS drives, right? So like you could do an LS on the file system, right? And you would get what you expect uh, a Directory and, and file listing. Well, you can also do an LS on the registry, right? So ls hklm colon backslash, like that's really cool. Uh, you can also use that to uh, look through like the certificate store. So just one of many reasons PowerShell is, is really, really handy. All right, eventing. This is that killer feature that attackers love to take advantage of. All right, so using WMI, we can trigger off nearly any conceivable event in the operating system. And the way that's achieved is, in order to register a WMI event, you need three things, all right? An event filter, so this is the action that we, you want to trigger off, uh, off of. So this will take the form of a uh, WQL query. Uh, the consumer, so upon firing that event, what are you gonna do, right? So 
Uh, Microsoft provides five standard uh, event consumers, uh, two of which are very useful for attackers. And then you just bind the two of those together, the trigger and then the, the payload, by using a filter to consumer binding. All right? Um, there's two ways in which these events can be executed. Uh, you can run them locally in just a host process. Um, for example, you can call like register dash WMI event to run it locally in the PowerShell process. Um, the real power out of this is, is when you register a permanent WMI event consumer. Um, so it persists across reboots and it also executes as system. All right, there's two types of event classes, intrinsic and extrinsic events. So I'm listing out all of the intrinsic events here. So um, WMI classes are organized hierarchically um, by namespaces. So uh, one of the most popular uh, namespaces is uh, root simv2. And when you're scripting with WMI, this, this is the default namespace that's used. So there's some really useful classes in there uh, for both offense and defense. So within every one of those classes, you have these special uh, system classes, the, these events, these intrinsic events. Uh, and you can be really flexible with how you create your uh, event filters. So for example, if you wanted to enumerate running processes, every time a new process is created, it creates an instance of a Win32 underscore process object. So you might tap into the uh, instance creation event and just filter out uh, instances of those Win32 process objects. Um, there's some malware I'll be discussing shortly that both creates and modifies namespaces, and it uses this as a C2 channel. There's another attack group that is creating and modifying WMI classes and using that as a pretty cool uh, command and control channel as well. Um, so in that case, you would have uh, the class creation event fire. So if you were registered to, to these types of events, then you could gain some insight. So as a defender, you might be able to uh, detect these things. As an attacker, um, you should be mindful that these events are going to trigger upon performing your malicious action. All right. Now there, there's these uh, specialized events called extrinsic events. There aren't that many of them, but they're highly performant and you don't have to specify like a polling interval. So these events fire immediately upon uh, each one of them occurring. So there's some pretty interesting events that I've listed here, both for attackers and defenders. All right, so Win32 process start trace, this fires immediately upon any process starting. So imagine there was some process, uh, like executable name that you were targeting, uh, I don't know, like pro, uh, procexp.exe, and um, upon triggering that, like you would just go and, and kill that process. Um, you, you could really get creative with these here. Uh, from a defense perspective, imagine using, uh, triggering off a Win32 module load trace, all right? This is fired upon um, any DLL, exe, uh, device driver uh, being loaded, okay? Um, Registry key change event, registry value change event. Uh, these should be pretty self-explanatory. Very powerful. All right, so WMI event filters. Again, I said um, the events that you want to trigger off of, these all take the form of a WQL, a WMI query language uh, query. And so here are two uh, examples of using these events, um, so using an uh, intrinsic and extrinsic query. All right, so um, let, let's look at this first one here, this intrinsic query. So at a high level, what this is going to trigger off of is the creation or modification of a, any file that has a doc or docx extension, all right? And the way we uh, kind of in interpret this is, uh, we're interested in any event that fires that is an instance creation event or an instance modification event of type of class type sim data file. All right, so whenever any uh, directory or file is created or modified, it fires off these events. Now we have to be a little more abstract in forming our query since we want to capture 
both creation and modification events, and both of those classes derive from the instance operation event. So that, um, that ultimately is what we want to trigger off of. Um, and then once that triggers, you can look at the target instance property, and those target instance properties are gonna take the form of that sim data file. So you can just inspect the uh, extension field and match it against the file extensions that you're interested in, in targeting. And here we have to specify a uh, polling interval, right? So um, one caveat with this is, say you have a file that's created and deleted within that 30 second interval, you're not gonna catch it, unfortunately. All right, so an extrinsic query, this is a pretty interesting one. This will fire immediately upon a volume change event. So if you were to look up this object uh, in MSDN, you would see that event type two is a removable drive. So this would fire upon insertion of removable media. All right. So once you have the WQL query that you form to target the event that you're interested in triggering, you wanna do something upon that triggering, right? So uh, the two uh, event consumers that attackers are you know, very fond of are ActiveScript event consumer, all right? You can embed any uh, uh, Windows script host language as a payload in this consumer. So a Windows script host language would be VBScript or JScript. All right, so you can have those payloads in line and nothing would be present on disk aside from being present in that objects.data file, the WMI repository. You can also execute anything at the command line using the command line event consumer. So imagine uh, someone inserts removable media and you want to execute some payload, right? So imagine you could execute, say, powershell.exe dash encoded command, and then you'd have, uh, I don't know, maybe like a drive infection payload that would drop something of interest onto that, uh, onto that USB stick, all right? Uh, the other standard event consumers are gonna be of particular interest to defenders, right? So we can append to a log file, create an event log entry, send an email, all right? Uh, and both of these are present in the simv2 and default namespaces. All right, so let's turn into some previous malware that has become public. So um, the first time I ever heard of WMI, like uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a sysadmin by trade, so um, I, I really had no idea what WMI was until around 2010 when I was reading up on all the articles about Stuxnet. And this wasn't really mentioned too much, but one of the exploits um, that Stuxnet took advantage of, or vulnerabilities that Stuxnet took advantage of was MS-10061, the printer spooler vulnerability, um, which basically enabled the attacker to write an arbitrary file to the file system. So just imagine, like, if you could drop any file to the file system in order to gain code execution, how might you go about doing that? So what the attacker did was they dropped one of those MOF files, which had embedded with it, uh, within it a permanent WMI event subscription. So they dropped it into a very specific directory and then there was basically like a watchdog process that would monitor that directory and if it detected that there was a new MOF file present in there, it would go ahead and consume it and you would automatically persist and gain code execution uh, in the system context. So Microsoft fixed this exploit primitive so that like that watchdog process will no longer just happily go consume any MOF file present in that directory. All right, then there was Ghost. This was a uh, commodity malware. Uh, there was a really good write-up on this uh, that Trend Micro did a while back. So what this malware did was it used a WQL query to the one that you saw previously that monitored for the creation or modification of any files, um, only rather instead of targeting a specific extension, it targeted a specific directory, specifically the, uh, the recent folder. So any new like recent documents, it would just uh, exfil those via an ActiveX control. So like it, it basically used like the IE com object to uh, upload the contents of those documents to some command and control server. All right, so the, the, the payload itself, like um, that ActiveX control was embedded within a VBScript payload via one of those ActiveScript uh, event consumer event consumers. All right, uh, and 
released not too long ago was a really cool tool called WMI Shell. Um, so this was the first case where I saw WMI used as like a pure C2 channel. All right, so the mechanism by which it used it as a C2 channel was it created WMI namespaces dynamically or modified them. Uh, so what that would allow you to do is like you could just stuff a payload in, uh, as the name of a WMI namespace and then you could do something like call the create method in the Win32 process class to consume that data, like say base64 decode it and execute like some PowerShell command that was embedded within it, right? Um, and then what you could also do is take the result of that malicious PowerShell command, write the output to say like another WMI namespace and then read that back remotely, say like using the get WMI object commandlet, right? So you're using WMI as a pure C2 channel, which is pretty cool. All right. So, WMI is extremely powerful, right? So, but uh, from an attacker's perspective, like there's really nothing you can't do from like a post exploitation perspective. So, look at every phase of of an attack, and you can accomplish that with WMI, given that you have proper credentials to to do so. All right. So, if you were to, sorry, I will get to reconnaissance briefly. Um, uh, so benefits to an attacker is, so the service, it's running on every single system, again, going back to like Windows 98 and NT4, all right, it's running as system. Every machine has its list, uh, is listening on like this DCOM port or like WinRM, uh, unless you've explicitly disabled this service. Um, it is relatively esoteric at this point. Um, hopefully after this talk it, it won't be. Um, so defenders like still aren't really aware of the uh, repercussions of attackers uh, leveraging WMI, all right? Nothing touches disk unless you want it to. The, the only exception being when you uh, register like a permanent WMI event subscription, it's only gonna be, that payload will only be present in objects.data. And AV will not touch that, right? That, I mean, it, for the same reason that AV would never flag on like ntds.dit, right? If you stored like some payload in some like, uh, like ACA directory property, uh, AV's not gonna touch this file, all right? Now, if you were to go about performing some reconnaissance as an attacker, these are some of the WMI objects that you might be interested in. In reality, uh, I did a scan of uh, this Windows 7 machine that I'm presenting from, and there's actually uh, just under 8,000 WMI classes available to you. These, these are just some of the highlights uh, that I'm presenting here. So you can get detailed host OS information using these WMI objects. You can perform registry operations, read from and write to the registry. So like you could use that STD regprov uh, WMI provider, say as a persistence mechanism, right? Like you could write um, powershell.exe dash encoded command and then have like your, your PowerShell stager, you could write that into the run key, right? Automatic persistence using WMI. You can enumerate processes, services, you can start, stop services, read the event logs, enumerate all of the patches on a system, uh, enumerate shares, create shares, delete shares, there's very little that you can't do here. All right, so this is extremely powerful and uh, attackers are already kind of aware of this. Uh, I've seen them using uh, Wimic.exe um, pretty often. So here's like the, the PowerShell variant of Wimic.exe for, for lateral movement. So I'm just calling invoke WMI method um, and within the Win32 process class, there's the static create method, all right? And this will just go execute uh, any, any command line program that, that you provide it. And I'm doing so remotely, all right? So just imagine replacing notepad.exe with powershell.exe dash encoded command, uh, insert malicious payload here. All right, here's an example of WMI persistence. So recall, 
uh, what I said the three requirements were uh, in order to persist. You need one of those event filters, event consumers, and the filter to consumer binding. So this is a, um, th this I, I found in the wild um, in the C-Daddy uh, malware family, which is uh, our internal family name. I, I think like the, the public name is uh, C-Duke. So the, the, there's some pretty good write-ups on, on this. Um, the, this is pretty basic. Um, it's broken down as follows. So you have this long query, which basically states, uh, fire this shortly after system startup. So it's just going to wait between 200 and 320 seconds, um, and then it's, gonna, uh, it's going to fire the event consumer, which is just that uh, command, line of, uh, command line event consumer, which just executes, uh, in, in this fictitious case, uh, evil.exe. All right, so not very sophisticated. So that this assumes that another binary was dropped to disk. So this isn't super stealthy in my mind, um, but it's illustrative of how you might go about like practically using WMI as a persistence mechanism in very few lines of code. All right, so I didn't, realized this until recently when um, I was pulled into uh, to this, this one case that we were investigating and uh, we've got some awesome uh, incident responders at, at Mandiant who had been investigating APT29. So you may be aware that FireEye released a report on the malware family called Hammer Toss and we attributed this to APT29. All right, what that paper did not discuss was the WMI attack vector that they used. So here's a small example of what APT29 was doing. All right, they were creating custom WMI classes dynamically and adding properties to those classes and stuffing payloads in them. So really the, this was very similar to like what the WMI shell tool does, only instead of creating and modifying namespaces, the attacker was just creating and modifying classes on the fly. So I didn't even realize that you could do this. Uh, I thought that you would have to drop a MOF file to create these classes dynamically when it turns out you can just use some of these uh, really handy um, .NET classes to achieve that for you. So this is an example of me doing that locally. Now the attacker was doing this remotely. So uh, you can just extend this a little bit to create and modify classes remotely. So imagine just stuffing your payload in there um, executing a malicious PowerShell command, saving the output to another class property, and then reading that back using WMI as a pure C2 channel. All right. And with that, so as I said before, uh, WMI shell was using those namespaces. APT29 were using uh, dynamically created classes. Um, you could also conceivably use the registry as a means of like staging your exfil. So using that uh, std regprov provider, like, you can just write arbitrary data to any registry uh, key, uh, key and value that you create, and then you can execute that embedded payload, uh, say write the result of that command to another registry value, and then read that back remotely. So these were the well, uh, so uh, attackers and researchers had already demonstrated the, the namespace and class creation. Um, I just kind of thought of like maybe using the registry. I'm sure there's other means of like pushing and pulling arbitrary data using WMI as well. If you think of any clever uses of uh, WMI as a C2 channel, let me know. I, I would be curious to know. All right. So um, I'm going to demonstrate an example here of using um, WMI to push a payload onto, uh, onto a victim system. In this case, we're going to plant some, uh, some sensitive evidence on, on our victim here. So in the first block, I'm just specifying the, the file name locally on my system that I want to drop onto the remote machine. Okay, so I'm going to read it in as a byte array, uh, convert it to a base64 string, and then I'm gonna set up my remote WMI connection. And what I'm gonna do after that is create the win32 underscore evil class class and create uh, an evil property that is attached to that class. 
And then I'm gonna stuff the base64 encoded content of the evidence that I wanna plant on the victim machine into that property, okay? So technically the contents of the file are present on that system, but they're only present in, uh, they're only present base64 encoded within objects.data, right, the WMI repository. So if we want to actually do something with that data that's stuffed in there, we might do something like this. So we're going to execute some PowerShell on the remote system, and we're going to read directly from the win32evilclass.evil property property, which has that base64 encoded uh, evidence. Uh, and then we'll drop it to uh, cfighterjetspecs.png, you yeah, know, whatever. Um, so the way we go about executing that is by calling the win32 process create method that uh, you should all be familiar with by now, okay? And then uh, you can also remotely confirm that the file was dropped by calling get wmi object uh, to see if there's an instance of the sim data file uh, present on that system that has that exact file name. All right, so in the previous example, we just dropped a file to this, so um, I, I called that like the, the push attack. Now in this case, um, this is very similar to like what APT29 was doing, only they were using custom classes like I used in the previous example. Uh, here I'm just going to use the registry as a means of sta uh, staging, well, pushing a payload and then reading the results of that payload back using the registry, all right? So I provide the credentials to the target system and I create the, uh, uh, in HKLM software evil key, that registry key, and then uh, the, uh, I'm going to delete the value of the uh, uh, present in result, because I'm gonna populate that in a second. All right, so he, um, just my fictitious payload here is I'm just gonna get a process listing uh, for, for LSAS, all right? Kind of a silly payload, but just it, it's good at demonstrating the, the, uh, the point here. So. Uh, when you call get process or anything for that matter in PowerShell, it returns objects. Um, I really like working with objects, so uh, I chose to uh, preserve my objects here by serializing them using the PS serializer class. So that just takes the contents of the object, uh, converts it to XML, and then I'll base64 encode it, save it in that registry key, pull it back, base64 decode it, so I pull it back using that std regprov provider, um, and then, so yeah, base64 decode it, and then call deserialize on it, and then I have this nice, beautiful PowerShell object um, that looks as if it had been executed locally, only it was, um, only it was the result of uh, that payload running on a remote system uh, that ultimately, like, I managed to return this, like, proper PowerShell object. All right. So uh, one other like theoretical attack that you might be able to perform is say, um, say you want to avoid calling the Win32 process create method, uh, which is you know, susceptible to uh, like process and uh, command line auditing, right? Because if you're executing like PowerShell.exe dash encoded command, uh, this might be logged and, uh, and, and reported. So if you wanted to be like extra stealthy, uh, conceivably what you could do is create a, temp a temporary permanent WMI event subscription. So the way you would do that is um, you would create a uh, ActiveScript event consumer consisting of your payload. Um, and so normally this would like persist across reboots, but then part of your payload would be, like the trigger for it would be say like an interval time, timer instruction. So you push the payload down, this timer instruction fires after say one minute. Uh, and then part of your payload is, so it executes all the malicious stuff first, and then it deletes itself. So it deletes its corresponding event filter, event consumer, and filter to consumer binding. So that's kind of a clean, like, a little more stealthy method, in my opinion, of uh, 
getting code execution on a remote system if you know that, um, say, command line auditing may be present. So the only thing that a defender might see would be the execution of scrcons.exe dash embedding. So uh, from an attacker's perspective, it's a little bit more stealthy because you wouldn't see something like in the previous cases where I was calling PowerShell.exe and executing uh, some um, like plain text command, you wouldn't see any of this. And then if you were to perform offline WMI forensics later on, this payload wouldn't be present in objects.data. All right. So I've talked about MOF files a little bit, but the reason I don't expand upon them it really is that I, I don't feel that they're necessary from an attacker's perspective. I think they just add unnecessary artifacts that would end up getting you caught. Really, uh, the only advantage, in, in my opinion, and, and please tell me if I'm wrong later on, the only advantage from an attacker's perspective is that um, these things will persist if you specify the pragma auto recover in your MOF file. Uh, they'll be consumed again like after uh, WMI corruption, which probably isn't gonna happen anyway. So, moving on. All right, briefly, WMI providers, these um, are kind of like the back end to WMI. So these provide the WMI subsystem with everything they need to provide the objects that you're interested in, right? So take Win32 underscore process. If you're enumerating all processes, there's some code on the system that has to enumerate running processes and then parse them, parse, uh, parse out that data and present it to you in such a manner that, um, that you can read it, say, like in PowerShell or Wimic.exe properly. So that's what these providers do. Uh, most of them are registered in the registry using, um, so each, um, each provider has a respective like Win32 provider class instance, and one of the properties is a GUID. So if you just take that GUID and then look it up in the registry, there would be a DLL, um, and that's the actual code that backs that provider. Uh, you can also have kernel drivers uh, act as providers as well, and those are all stored in the root WMI namespace. All right, so what might one of these providers look like? Well, there are some legitimate uh, providers from third parties, one of them being, well, legitimate is, uh, you know, kind of a subjective term here. Um, <laughs> on, on my Lenovo ThinkPad laptop, I have installed this, um, this device driver, uh, WMI provider, that, so you can use it to remotely get like BIOS settings and remotely set BIOS settings. So, sure, that might be legitimate. Um, <laughs> now, so um, I, I was talking with, uh, with my colleagues, uh, Willie and Claudio, and Willie brought up a while ago um, just that, you know, theoretically, like, why not just create a malicious WMI provider, right? Because then you could maybe um, create some, like, interesting custom, like, WMI objects, implement your own methods, right? So, like, the Win32 process create method is really nice for attackers. Why, don't, why, why can't we extend that, right? So I reached out to some buddies on Twitter, and uh, uh, Casey Smith and, and Jared Atkinson, these guys, these guys are awesome. So they banged out some proof of concept actual like legitimate malicious WMI providers like that very night when, when I gave them all of these, uh, these, these requirements. So the first one that Casey did was he created a, a shellcode runner implemented as a WMI provider. So if you were to take this WMI provider DLL, drop it onto the victim system, install it with installutil.exe, then you've got a means of executing shellcode either locally or remotely uh, onto that victim machine, um, and that shellcode runs in, in the system context. Pretty cool. Um, Jared, uh, what, he, um, what he wanted to do was enumerate all active network connections, because in Windows 7 and below, you don't get any built-in classes that allow you to enumerate this stuff. Um, so he did that, and he also allowed uh, you to execute arbitrary PowerShell in the system context. All right, 
So I wanted to take some of these uh, like theoretical attacks and extend them a little bit uh, into the form of a pure WMI backdoor. So you can get this online now. Um, all it requires is a PowerShell installer. It doesn't require that PowerShell be present on the system. All right. Um, so yeah, again, PowerShell is not required. And it installs uh, several permanent WMI events. All right, so it does a few things. Uh, you can implement your triggers. So you might want to fire off at a regular interval at a certain date time. You might want to target a certain process name, new or modified files, um, interactive logon, or drive insertion, all right? And then you bind that together with a respective action. So you could say, um, combine the uh, file creation trigger with the file upload action, okay? or drive insertion trigger with infect drive action. And then you register those together with the uh, register WMI backdoor uh, command. All right, so here is a brief example of the generic backdoor that I implemented uh, in this code. So what I'm doing here is I'm queuing up a few commands. All right, this is just a uh, VB script um, like file dropper, so I'll queue that up in my back door. Next, I'm gonna queue up a uh, PowerShell file dropper, and uh, instead of just executing like VB script directly, I'm gonna save that into a WMI class property. All right, and then I'll create, uh, I'll queue up another command to execute something at the command line, uh, in this case being PowerShell.exe uh, dash command, and then what the payload is gonna do is pull that down from the WMI class, base64 decode it and execute it. All right. There's a little bit more of this video, but in the interest of time, I wanna move on to the next example, the file uploader. So I have my C2 server listening, all right, on the right side, and then on the left side, I will uh, install my file uploader. And um, <clears throat> so whenever any file is created or modified, it's going to upload those contents um, to the command and control server. So I provide all the code for this WMI backdoor freely online. Um, I'm not providing the uh, C2 server itself though. All right, um, I don't have much time left. Um, so I wanna maybe try to get away with this live demo here, the, the drive infection payload. All right. So I'm gonna take this here, copy it into my victim. All right, and just to prove to you that nothing is on this USB stick. Let's hope it pops up here. All right, sorry, not gonna deal with this now, I guess. <laughs> Demo fail. All right, so what it would have done if, uh, if my VM did recognize it is immediately upon insertion, it would have dropped my file. Uh, in this case, as you'll see in the code, it just drops the EI car signature, which uh, is supposed to flag antivirus immediately. Uh, I'm not really doing anything too subversive. Uh, again, th this is just a proof of concept that I wanted to demonstrate. Um, another thing that I was gonna show is uh, the process killer, where um, I, I would be targeting uh, process explorer, and then anytime that opens, um, the payload would, would just automatically kill that. All right, so uh, real, real briefly, some, uh, some mitigations. You can enumerate WMI persistence remotely, all right? Using PowerShell as a great example, there are some existing utilities out there. Autoruns and Kanza are great for detecting this stuff after the fact. Um, and I'm gonna be discussing this in much more depth uh, at DEF CON on Saturday with my colleagues. So WMI is actually a really awesome agentless host IDS. All right, so there's a ton of attacker actions that would take place that would fire off um, these uh, WMI events. And so if you just subscribe to those events, then there's all kinds of uh, things that you might be able to detect. For example, if an attacker creates uh, like persistence in, uh, via the registry or the start menu, there's a really handy 
uh, WMI object, uh, win32 underscore startup command, uh, an instance of that is created. So you could tap into that and detect attacker persistence, or registry or start menu persistence using just that mechanism. You could also use this to detect uh, whenever permanent WMI event subscriptions are created, right? So you have a permanent WMI event subscription that detects permanent WMI event subscriptions. You can get really creative here. All right, finally, some, some mitigations are you can just outright disable this service if you don't need to access it remotely. Uh, you can apply firewall rules to say uh, block those DCOM ports. There are some great, uh, pretty detailed event log entries. Um, and then, as I said, you can have preventative permanent WMI event subscriptions. Uh, lastly, you can also apply ACLs to all of the WMI namespaces. So you can prevent, like, um, for example, the Win32 process uh, create method from being uh, executed by applying ACLs properly. All right. Just a quick shout out to my buddies, uh, Will Schroeder and Justin Warner, who helped me out and came up with some pretty creative uh, event filters. Um, to my awesome coworkers who reversed the entire format uh, and really opened up uh, the field of WMI forensics because there was no forensics capability prior to uh, today at B-Sides when we uh, presented the, the defensive and forensic side. All right, and lastly, to all defenders who are taking WMI seriously or hope to take WMI seriously after, after this talk. All right, I don't have time for questions, uh, but th thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll be just outside the door if, if any of you have, have any questions, so thank you.